All right, so we're going to get into our second panel, uh, which uh, is called Color Grading for Broadcast and Films. We have uh, brought our colorist friends here, and um, I, I wanted to get this exact group of people because, frankly, they work on stuff that is, uh, I, I would say, a lot more, uh, has a lot more big boy pants uh, than, than some of us do, <laughs> right? Um, I'm used to doing stuff for, for uh, YouTube, you know, doing short films and, and things like that. But as far as, you know, <laughs> films that, you know, the entire world sees and um, broadcast and kind of some bigger projects, uh, that that can sometimes be a whole different ball game. So uh, I'm really excited for you guys to to give us some uh, knowledge and wisdom from what you've learned in years in in uh, color grading broadcast and color grading films and stuff. So thank you guys so much for being here. Thanks for having me. So um, let's start this out with uh, <laughs> thanks. So let's let's start this out with uh, what what is what does a job that hits your desk typically look like, right? Is it uh, edited on edited on other systems? Is it an XML? Like what what does somebody hand you if it's going to be uh, you know one of your typical projects? Wait, should I go first? Yeah, Tell, right. I'm I'm waiting for your answer. Typically looks like a mess. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, two flavors coming in. It's either going to be. Um, uh, linking back to the original files via XML, okay, and or it's going to be a baked-in file, which is invariably going to mean it's going to be a quicker conform, okay. So we're going to get the job. We're going to start grading a lot quicker doing that process. Disadvantage to that is I'm not accessing the original files, thus I can't access things like raw and and that sort of thing. Um, I would also have a conversation with the production team first, or the, in, definitely the editor and just work out which route we're going down because I've got to allow for some conform time, which can be anything from 20 minutes to three, four hours, depending the complexity and where it's come from. If they've done resizing in Premiere, I'm gonna allow a little bit of extra time for that, for sure. And, um, and they'll send me a reference file so I can see what the uh, uh, reference from the actual timeline itself. So I've got that as, uh, my sort of um, hero guide to this This is what this frame should look like. So any resizing, I can match it back to that. Um, but it's definitely a conversation with the production team and particularly the editor first to see which way we want to go. So uh, ideally, I want an XML file or an AAF if it's coming from Avid. that's going to relink back to the original master files. Uh, with documentary work, that might mean relinking back to not camera rushes. It might be linking back to archive material. But all the same, I want the best quality that I can possibly get. But that is going to allow a little bit of extra time into the into the grading process because we've got to conform it in. With things like music promos, I invariably get those as a flattened file with all the grade taken off, and we'll have a, an EDL or an XML file from the edit, which will then automatically chop the scenes so I can grade individual scenes, albeit a single file. That means the conform is very easy because I'm grading off a master record. So, mm -hmm. so that's. That's the workflow I like, but um, I, I, often, often, ideally, I would want the original XML files. We've also got to factor in getting it onto my server. So they walk into the, into the suite with a drive they bought from, I would say, Curry's in England, but it's probably, what, Costco here or something. It is, you know, they think it's a great drive because it's got 15 terabytes on it, and it's got a 5400 spin speed on it and a USB 2 out. So we're spending... Uh, Luckily for me, six hours at color grading time, just copying it onto my server, which I'm, is happy days. <laughs> the, uh, the producers normally are uh, pretty annoyed by that point. So that's, that's typically my workflow. I would say the systems are, that they're coming from uh, is uh, annoyingly still not resolved. I'm not seeing edits. Be bear in mind, they're coming to me for the, for the post, so I'm not, I'm not editing. I'm not, I'm not doing the whole workflow in my studio. They're coming to me for post-production and color grading. So that'd be effects and color. So typically we're seeing an avid still for broadcast documents. I do a lot of you know, BBC, ITV. I'm working on a big Channel 4 job at the minute. These are coming from avid or premier. Um, typically a mix of both. I would say we're probably more, we see more premier than we do avid, but avid is still, you know, it's, it's very strong. Avid is not going away. Uh, we're seeing, I'm hoping to see less and less premier timelines coming in, to be honest. Um, I have conforming hell with a lot of those projects. Uh, I do have a crib sheet that I send out to the editor before, and I was always have a conversation. In fact, I get nervous if the editor hasn't phoned me at some point during the edit to just say, hi, yeah, I'm John, what do you want? 
if they, yeah, I'm like, please call me if you. you know, and you the, call that a crib sheet? That's the term that you use. Uh, uh, yeah, is that prep sheet? I think is like that. That maybe what more of us are familiar with, or it's like the lingo that we use internally in my shop anyway. Yeah. Crib sheet. I kind of like yeah. that better. Can okay. I have that? You can have the crib okay. sheet if you want. Cool. Um, I, need you to, I need to get your crib sheet actually, so I know have, how to yeah. prep edits for you. So it literally has the two different methods clearly laid out. I will even identify which method we'd have agreed to use, whether that's XML, AF, or flattened file. And it literally tells them, you know, you need to flatten everything down onto the lowest possible layer. Uh, again, if they want me to do that, I'm happy to do that at color grading rates. It's really not a problem. Um, but I just send it out so it's literally in black and white, the process that I need. And it, it generally goes pretty smooth. Daria, is that how it rolls for you? Can I check your... You know what? Yeah, I was listening to Darren and I'm like, yeah, he's hitting all the points, like a lot of very similar workflows that I go through. So especially, he said he had his two main approaches. I would say receiving things via XML and usually having uh, yeah, either a drive or even sometimes like a RAID shipped to me, so like a much bigger storage device uh, that's happened in the past, especially if they're sending me raw media, so it's quite a lot of information. Um, and another common approach is uh, the last few years I've been telling clients, you know, here is, you know, my crib sheet, you know, you got to conform everything to one video track, et cetera, et cetera. But also, I'm going to give you this option. If you create, if you import this project into DaVinci Resolve and you conform it yourself, and then you just send me either the DRA with all the media, preferably, or at least, you know, the DRP. Actually, it doesn't make sense for you to just send it the DRP because they still have to send all the media. So DRA is really the best. Then I could knock off, you know, X amount from my, like, the, the final fee, you know, like X amount of hours or days. Uh, and a lot of people take me up on that, you know, they'll say, yeah, that's fine. Like they prefer to have something like an assistant editor who's already familiar with DaVinci Resolve, prep the project for me and then send it off. And then it's quite beneficial for them financially to do it that way. And it's beneficial for me because I don't really enjoy conforming as much as I enjoy grading. So I'm happy to do it. Yeah, that's a, a great ad. And I, I would second uh, what these guys have said. I think it's, you know, like getting that initial turnover is just the beginning of a long, ongoing, detailed, collaborative conversation. No one likes conforming. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I imagine that that is uh, that's kind of the, the necessary evil before you get to the fun part. And uh, what, a, what a great idea to tell somebody like, hey, just prep this and resolve and then then I just have it, you know, and it's and it's available uh, in the way that you think it's going to look, and you're happy with it. And then I don't have to guess, you know, did I resume this thing just right or not? You yeah. know, yeah. wonderful. Okay, so um, what about the difference between grading like a documentary versus a music promo versus a feature? Like, do you go into a project uh, differently based on the kind of genre it is? And um, Colin, let's start with you this time. I would say not necessarily. You know, I, I go into every project with a fairly blank slate. It just depends on whether there's an existing relationship there or whether it's a new relationship. And you know, honestly, kind of the same theme that I just wrapped up with on our last talking point of like getting a, a collaborative conversation going early in the process to figure out what are the needs of this project. The needs of this nonfiction may be very similar to a short film that I did last year, or it may be completely different from any doc I've ever done before. It depends more on project and relationship and on, you know, sort of creative intent and desire more than, you know, necessarily a, a recurring theme that I see with, oh, nonfiction tends to go this way or, you know, like short form goes that way, et cetera. Those things can vary a ton in my experience. Uh, yeah, I think for me, I'm, I don't really do feature film work. It, we're very much uh, I'm, I'm quite known for documentary work and music videos in the last couple of years I've done a lot. I do treat them quite differently actually. I think the, in terms of you know, the grade I'm hoping they still have the same uh, pleasing output at the end but with documentary I'm very much um, it's that time grade ratio and often you find with the documentary the documentary work is much harder than the music video work and the music videos often look like they would take longer to do, I guess hour by hour they do take longer to do, but they look mm -hmm. more glossy. But the documentary work, often it's been shot in situations where they have no control. So for example, if they're doing an interview with someone, it might be at their house, it might be at a, a place of natural history or something like that that's to do with the documentary. Normally when we sit down in the grade, this is where the director goes, oh, by the way, yeah, this scene, we had real problems. So you're like, okay, yeah, of course, of course you did. <laughs> yeah. um, so I'm there to fix those problems and make it all still look nice and uniform. 
So I do think I have to approach that slightly differently. I have less time per shot. So as soon as I bring a documentary in, the first thing I do is go, there's a little eye symbol. I haven't got resolve here, but there's a little eye in the corner, which tells me how many clips I've got. So, uh, which is, comes back to sort of how much time I've got to do a documentary versus a music promo. Uh, people say, how, how long does it take to grade a one hour documentary? I need to know how many shots it is. I don't care, it's an hour. It might be 25 shots. Um, if they load, if come up and there's 2,000 shots in that hour, that's a different beast. So, so you're saying it doesn't take an hour to grade a one hour documentary? <laughs> <laughs> the producers seem to think so for some reason. <laughs> so I'll come back to that, that's another story. Um, so I do have to manage my time very well. So my, my no tree and the, the depth I can give that grade really depends on how many shots, what's potentially gone wrong, how much archive there is in there, so how much of it I can't color manage. Obviously the color management is a big part of getting you to the right starting point as Colin explained this morning. Uh, music videos, I can tend to, it tends to be shot in a controlled environment or uncontrolled environment, but often the same environment. It's probably the same camera uh, or it'd be the same camera and the same B camera. So it's a lot easier to grade. And then we've got that extra time to give it a real distinct look, which is invariably what they want from a, from a music video. So I, I, I think they are two very different approaches. My node structure for a music video would be something like 25 nodes. I'm not necessarily using all those, but I'm probably using 15, 16 of them. My node structure, my fixed node tree for a documentary would be probably 13, 14 nodes maxed out. I'm going to use five or six of them. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I'm not allowed to go beyond that to keep within the realms of the time constraints that we've got. So yep. I, I, I tackle them differently and, and they're, they're both different beasts. What does Daria yeah. do? Oh, uh, well, once again, it's very pleasing to see that I'm in complete agreement with both of you. So yeah, every project has a completely different approach. And I think, Colin, you made reference to like uh, thinking of previous projects before you decide on a workflow. It's the same thing for me. Um, I will go through a timeline and pretty much like analyze it, like how many cameras did they use? How many issues do they have with like the lighting? Is there going to be a lot of balancing work? Maybe one unpopular opinion I have, not really an opinion, but more like just a, a feeling, is that I actually really enjoy the balancing process. So when I receive like a documentary with like loads of like different cameras and uncontrolled lighting, I get a little bit excited. I'm like, oh yes, this is like a big problem that I need to solve. Because I find it pretty satisfying, you know, like almost therapeutic to kind of go through it and get everything to like flow naturally. You're so sick. I, 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 yeah. yeah, it's I'm weird. Sorry. You're not free next Thursday, are you? <laughs> <laughs> uh, but then, uh, yeah, having said that, uh, yeah, like every project uh, is just so unique. I would never, this is why I always get a bit thrown off by people when they ask, like, how do you color grade or do you have color grading tips? You know, they really want this blanket explanation or series of steps. You know, they just want the answer that all the colorists know that, you know, everyone else doesn't know. And there just isn't an answer. Like you genuinely just have to keep practicing the craft and then eventually you realize how, you know, you have to hone your approach to every project. Um, so yeah, that's like a skill to have. That's essentially, I think someone told me this years ago is that you don't get paid for your talent so much as you get paid for your experience because you're no longer learning as much on the job, you are now invoking your past experiences on every single approach, and that's what makes you faster. So. Yeah, that's well put. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, yeah what, what a great a great point, you know, because that, that thinking on the fly, especially, you know, when you have a client behind you and they're expecting, you know, to uh, you to give, give them the, the, uh, the amount of work for their money, you know, and you can draw on that experience and, um, and you know how to solve those problems rather than just trying it, you know, as you go. That's awesome. Um, so, on that, let's talk about uh, how do you how do you guys manage time? I mean, I know uh, sometimes you'll have a project with thousands of clips in it, you know, and you'll have three days to grade it. Um, how do you how do you manage time and budget and uh, and your priorities and stuff when it comes to working on a color project? Let's, let's start with Daria this time. Actually, I was just trying to fix the audio issue that we had with the echo. I assumed it was on my end. No, I don't think so. I think oh, it's still getting something an echo. with us, but oh, okay. is it livable? Are we good though? I'm, I'm good either way. Okay. Just, that was, it sounds a little bit more intimate now because I'm, I'm hearing you straight in my ears. Yeah, you, you go ahead, Daria. <laughs> Um, sorry, and uh, I was slightly distracted. You were asking about budget. Uh, priorities, time management, uh, how, how to 
work quickly when you have a lot of shots? Mm. Yeah, I find that really difficult to do, especially when I hear a lot of colors go, saying stuff like, oh, you know, yeah, I do like 400 shots, you know, in an hour and this and that, you know, and I'm like, oh God, you know, like I, <laughs> like I really struggle to do three digits in one day, you know, to be honest. Uh, but uh, I have started like what's helped me a lot is like gamifying uh, the coloring process. So I'll set myself like, you know, like how many shots can I do in like an hour? Bef well, not in an hour, like, like in half an hour before I get my first like visual break, you know, before I have to leave the room and just like refresh my eyes. Um, and I kind of find that makes, you know, kind of takes the edge off because I'm really bad at just sitting down and concentrating on something for hours on end. Uh, so yeah, that's that's kind of the way I do it. I, I know it's I don't know if that's unorthodox or not the best use of budget, but uh, yeah. How about you guys? What are you doing? You know, I, I try to learn from you know we we talked uh, in my session earlier briefly about how you know like digital color grading is so young and it's so new and like they're it's just a very new discipline. And I try to learn from our predecessors, color timers, and from like the photochemical mm -hmm. tradition, where like you would start with a one light of everything. That's where I try to get the whole timeline before I get precious about anything, before I get precious about windows or ratios or finesse or anything. I try to get every single shot looking visible and sensible so that you know the, the first mush for me is like, let's get to that first viewing link or get to, if we're gonna be sitting together in person, enough of a level of completion that we can sit together and start to evaluate, oh, where do we wanna fill things in or knock things down or whatever it is. There's a certain amount of diligence that it takes just to get to that point. Um, that's really my focus, so I am trying to get, I'm, I'm trying to get those those triple and quad digits in a day for sure, and like let go of my, my you know, like, habit of just getting fixed and I'm like yeah but this also needs this this and that and that I try to like just do really broad strokes really big picture do the one light for the whole thing and let that be the first pass and then from there start to to build and tweak and uh, adjust from that point and you know like I'll also say that that requires ammunition and some buy-in from a client so we need to have some sense of agreement of like all right are we doing like a film print level of contrast or are we doing like this like airy delicate you know, like semi log type of look. Like we need to sort of have that stuff decided before I'm going to start doing anything. Um, but once that's in place, then I, I try to get to that first mile marker of a one light first pass as quickly as I can and be as unprecious about it as I can. Yeah. Okay. My, mine's that's interesting because mine's slightly different from that. That we let's take a, a one hour documentary for example. I would spend uh, and let's argue I've got two days to do that. I would spend the time getting the look that we want. I would then test that, and that's the full look. Uh, mm -hmm. So with film print emulation, the whole shebang. I would then test that on various scenes just to check I've not, I'm not going down a hole that I can't get out of later on. Um, checking that with, you know, how's that going to look with some archive footage? How's that going to look with exterior and interior stuff? I would spend more time on the interview setups, so making sure they really get some love because you're going to keep coming back to that mm -hmm. shot throughout. But for me, when the, and I very often have the client with me, it's pretty rare now with you know, post COVID that my, my clients are pretty much back. But they want to see if I get to the end of this program, they don't want to see me go back to the beginning again and go, right, we're going to do level three now. Um, mm. And I don't want to give them that comfort that they think they've got to the end. It's like, no, 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 I need another day yet. We're, <laughs> we're not quite there. Uh -huh. So I kind of really road test it scene by scene. And then I literally regret, and I, I have a, um, a conversation with them that. When I leave a clip, if you haven't said anything, I presume you're happy. But don't, don't tell me in 10 minutes, like, can we just go back? I mean, obviously we do go back and we look and we review and we tweak and I've got a node or two nodes set for doing that tweaking. But when I'm moving forward, I'm moving forward. When I get to the 60 minute, we're, we're done. Bar, uh, particular VFX, uh, things that are gonna take a little bit of time that we need to do. Maybe if it's something that's come up and it's late afternoon and it's a, pr a tricky bit of tracking that I need to do or something like that. Let's do that tomorrow. I'll just flag the clip. Um, but invariably, I'm moving forwards uh, on it. Yeah, in terms of, and, and just in terms of budget, you were talking, I'll, I'll, I'll be quick, but I, uh, I normally get to have a look at uh, an offline edit so I can have a quick look. Again, going back to my, how much does it cost to grade an hour? How many shots is it? That's what I need to know. But I also need to know how complex is this going to be? How much VFX work is there? How much awkward stuff is there? How much fixing is there to do? So I will give them a, a, a quote not based in pound notes or dollars actually pound is dollars now yeah. <laughs> one to one 
thank you for that, our government. <laughs> um, so, um, but I'm pretty much accurate in terms of how long I want for this job. I'm good within plus or minus you know, an hour or two. And if we're wrong at the end of the day, it's not because I'm slow at color grading by any stretch. It's because the parameters have changed. So, so in terms of budget, I quote for hours, not price. And then if it takes longer, it's not because of me. So mm -hmm. it kind of helps soften the blow. Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, how do you ensure that it's, it's not because of you, that, you know? Because I know what I'm doing. <laughs> sure, sure. I mean, I, I'm, that's through experience. I'm confident enough to know. I know how long this is going to take. Um, and I'm, I'm pretty good on this. Yeah, yeah. I know what I'm doing. <laughs> no, I, I, honestly, I, I, I think about that question all the time, and I think that's one of the reasons I have the strategy I do of trying to get orient priorities in such a way that it is as close to what I understand it ought to look like as early as possible, minus, you know, like, you know, qualifiers and windows and secondaries and all that stuff that like colorists love to do, like we love to get in there and finesse things. Those things are called secondaries for a reason. So like my big strategy is to, you know, hit it really well with those primaries, get the look in place as Darren mentioned, so that there's opportunity to know early while there is still time left in the tank to say like, we're actually not quite on the same page. That's not what we had in mind, Colin. We had something different in mind. At that point, I've got bandwidth or, or latitude, I should say, to, to pivot a little bit and say, okay, let's figure something else out before we're like, well, what do you mean? I've only got three hours left in the budget and you know, we're, we're already set to, to ship here. That's you know, like fail fast, I guess would be the, the idea there is like leave, leave room for pivoting early in the process, early enough in the process that there's the chance to do something constructive. And, and that's possibly why I do my theory of I'm just moving forward, because if it's a one hour and we've got two days, at the end of day one, I want to be 30 minutes into the show. We're, you know, we've mm, got to, sure. <laughs> so if you want to be out of here do tomorrow. You, when you're doing your, uh, your uh, estimates and sort of initial scope, do you talk about, you, you stipulate hours, do you stipulate passes at all, or is that just implicit? Uh, yeah, yeah, but, but I'm, I'm expecting, you know, they're going to have a look at it, they're yeah. going to review it, and yeah, but I'm going to So do you talk about, about with them, like, hey, I'm going to give you five passes or two passes or well, whatever? No, because normally they're in the room. I want, yeah, yeah. I want them there. So it's like, we, yeah, we make that decision. Makes sense. Here's your finished program. See you next week. Makes sense, yeah. Great. Yeah, thank you guys. Um, so let's kind of dive into that a little bit more because I know um, especially people who, are, who might be new to color want to know a little bit more about how the pros do it. When you are, um, maybe, maybe you can give us a little bit more specifics of like when you sit down and you have the shot, the, the project, and it's conformed, it's, it's ready for color, like what are your major steps? you know, uh, from kind of beginning to end. Um, Darren, why don't we start with you? Yeah, sure. So, uh, so I work on fixed no trees. I have several, uh, probably three. So my music videos, as I already mentioned, would have a, a no tree that looks pretty scary, but it's kind of empty with a few things switched on and off. So my, like I, I love using Dehancer and things like that. I've got it ready to go. Um, so the fixed no tree helps me it disciplines me in the order of operations that I'm going to work. So I look at it, I go, okay, yeah, my first thing is let's get the balance going. That this helps the speed. So this is why, yeah, I know I can grade quickly. Um, so yeah, that, there's that discipline, but the color management is key straight away. I'm working, I'm getting my color management sorted, get my CSTs. I, I work uh, node-based color management. So Colin, you were talking earlier about mm -hmm. whether you're going DaVinci YRGB color managed or whether you're just staying in regular DaVinci YRGB and I use a color space transform to do my um, to do my color management so I would get all that in order so I guess it's a little bit like you were saying you go through the whole program to get your first look mm -hmm. I'm doing that in terms of color management and all my all my nodes have got the fixed node tree on so I guess I'm kind of doing a light first look <coughs> straight away but that's that's how I get going so my node tree disciplines me it, re it reminds me what I need to do uh, mm -hmm. I've got a very straight fix right you'd be you'd be surprised how little tools in doing choose of i use um but the majority of what i'm using has been there forever um i did use the magic mask last week on a job which was great was it magic yeah it, it saved us hours <laughs> until <Daria>. client that but <laughs> what, what does daria do that's my stock question for this conversation. <laughs> what would daria you do? know i ask myself that all the time <laughs> it's like one of my standard questions you have it on a bracelet <laughs> Oops. Uh, so I uh, I don't really use fixed note trees very much. 
I uh, almost always like start a project from scratch. Like I said, I evaluate things. And I think for um, mostly for documentaries that require quite a lot of corrective work. And I, I like to break that up sometimes uh, because I find myself repeating the same few steps over and over again. That's where I create a fixed node tree for that project. So it's almost like on a pro per, sorry, per, per project basis when I need to use it. Uh, but there are times when I'll go the whole project without one. Uh, I like using remote versions sometimes. Like if I detect that, oh, okay, they actually used like pretty much four or five very long takes throughout the entire, like, you know, maybe an interview or something like that. And I'm like, okay, I'll just grade one version of a clip and that will travel across all the other instances of it throughout the timeline. So that kind of stuff. Um, and I've also been inspired, like I've been to some other suites and watched professional colorists and I've seen some colorists doing an entire feature film using like one or two nodes. Uh, and that's just like really invigorating to see because you're like, wow, that's, you know, they ended up with a really beautiful look and that's really impressive. So yeah, I just kind of do sort of as I go, as I evaluate, not every clip needs to be matched. For example, not every clip needs balancing. So I kind of like to keep the node editor tidy for that reason. And yeah, that's, that's my answer. I'll give you guys my two guiding principles, which is really just kind of a maybe a, a, a lens on a lot of the points that we're emphasizing. My two guiding principles uh, for this subject are uh, two of my colorist 10 commandments. The first one being macro beats micro. So if I can come up with a solution that serves 10 shots, that is fundamentally more valuable than a solution that serves one shot. So I'm looking for any of those possible solutions first before I do local solutions. I'm looking for macro solutions. And then similarly, broad beats narrow. If I can find a broad solution that gets done what I need to, that's fundamentally more valuable than a narrow solution because it's cleaner and it is going to have a more, a greater chance of having a macro uh, consistent impact. So that's kind of the lens that I look at things through. And that's, the, it's, you know, like if you think about color management, that's the ultimate example of macro beats micro because I can get the whole timeline into a much better place than it was 30 seconds ago just by implementing proper color management. From there, I get into a macro level creative transform, a look that doesn't change, or creative transform that stays the same across all the shots. That's more valuable than no matter how great a job I might do making shot 345 look amazing, if the other 900 shots haven't moved, that's not as valuable as a macro level creative transform that makes everything look better. So my whole system is kind of trying to work from broad and macro down to micro and narrow and almost like hold off on local shot level color grading as long as I possibly can. Yeah, that's that's kind of a principle I, I, I feel like I've heard from from all of you is is starting with kind of the bigger chunks and getting smaller and smaller as you need to. Yeah. And I mean that that's something that uh, you know, I think is good just for workflow in general, whether you're editing, whether you're doing sound mixing, um, starting with the, the great big, the great big rocks, you know, that can fit in the jar. And then you put the little rocks in after that, you guys have seen that, that, uh, illustration. Um, speaking of all the little rocks and everything, um, what about, uh, the fancy things, right? Um, what kind of things are expected of a colorist these days? I mean, are you guys doing basically like Rotoing and, and compositing sometimes. Are you just strictly color? Do you just do you just say no to a client if they want more and tell them to go go back to VFX or whatever? But um, where do you kind of land on that stuff? I'll give you. <laughs> I bet I know mind. Darren's answer. I want I want to hear. <laughs> I want to hear Darren. <laughs> um, this is going to be good. Yeah, you sure? You want me to go first? Okay. I'm okay. a colorist. <laughs> go back. I mean, I, I mean, obviously, there's a whole world of new tools that we can go into. I'm there to do the color grade, okay? So I'm not there to start comping stuff out and go into fusion. I know a lot about Fairlight, though, after yesterday. So yeah. you know, maybe be we'll start doing. addressing audio <laughs> notes. So obviously, audio I don't touch apart from turning the radio up. That's about as far as my audio goes. Um, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of information out there now, so I'm, well, I'm guilty for starting a YouTube channel that actually tells people how easy it is to replace a sky. Um, so <laughs> all the producers are going, hey, it's really easy to watch this video. Um, so it's managing that expectation of what we're going to do in the grade, how extra you want to go, a little object removal stuff, I want to take out a little fire extinguisher or a, a light switch. That's a really easy thing for me to just do. It's added value to the client. But what I don't want to happen is I've estimated 14 hours on a job. 
I'm going to be good, my plus or minus one hour, and then I invoice 18 hours because I've been in fusion pulling stuff out, or even I'm experimenting with the magic mask. You know, so this the first time I used it properly on a commercial last week, uh, I had to test it out quite a bit to just check I wasn't getting myself down a hole that it, and it mm -hmm. was going to work because it's obviously new in version 18, the object mask, sorry, specifically, not the not the person mask. So I'm, I'm very careful what I will offer, but it's always nice to be able to just say to the client, Look, yeah, that's a really easy fix. They're going to get, you know, it's like, well, let's go back to Darren because he, you know, he just goes that little extra mile and he'll do that stuff. But with the caveat, I don't want to annoy the producer that I'm invoicing for an extra four hours just because the tools are there. I'm also very fond of my VFX uh, collabs who I work with. Um, they're there for a reason. They know what they're doing. Uh, yeah. So I think the tools are great if you're, uh, you know, if it's your own company, it's your own production. Philly Boots, you know, those tools are there. But I've got to meet a, a broadcast deadline, and I'm there. Uh, uh, yeah, my role is a colorist, so I need to try and keep that true. But but a lot of the new tools are helping me get that color very quick. You know, I'm not going to deny it. There's, yeah. there's fantastic tools. But I think, as I said earlier, 99.9% of what I'm doing is tools that have been in there forever. And I love all the new tools, but. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I have a phrase quote that uh, often if something's a little bit challenging, I just remind them that I'm a colorist, not Jesus. <laughs> there's, no, limit, there's limits that I'll go to. No, and you know, I mean, that's a, a, a pretty good way to put it. Like for me to go back to uh, one of Casey's questions is like, you know, do you just say no sometimes? Like, no, I won't do that. The answer for me is never no. The answer is always, like, if I have the ability to do it, the answer is yes, but. And the but for me is like, the further you move me off of creatively grading your image, the less of my value that you're getting, but you're still paying my same rate. So I, I try to just very gently uh, guide things back that way because I say, look, I promise you this is where I'm valuable to you. I, I promise you you're going to end up getting, there's almost certainly someone who can do what you're asking me to do better for the same or quite likely less than the hourly that you're paying me to color grade. So, you know, as Darren says, quick fix. Why not? Sure, happy to do it. But uh, you know, like the more we can stay focused on where I'm valuable, the happier we're all going to be. Darian? Yeah, I get to disagree again. Uh, <laughs> so I actually started off as a 2D VFX compositor, uh, and I'm still quite passionate about it. In the last few years, I've transitioned to doing this in Fusion, um, and I was doing like 2D compositing for a few years. And at the time, so this was a bit been around like 2009, 2010 era, smaller productions were not really uh, using colorists as often. That was just when people were transitioning to like log footage. Uh, so they would kind of tap on coloring as like a the finishing part of uh, a compositor's job. So they'd say, can you also color grade the footage before you deliver the timeline? And I'd be like, well, I don't really know anything about color, but okay, you know. So I'd do something and it wouldn't look good, but it would be good enough for the clients to accept it. And people would come back and, you know, keep asking for coloring work with their VFX. And then eventually, I guess, like my reputation kind of shifted a little bit where people started coming to be purely for VFX. So I sort of got gently like pushed. I want to say push, not shoved, into be becoming a colorist professionally, but I do still very much enjoy the whole problem solving aspect of compositing. So any chance I get, I will do it. But like like the fellas just said, I will set expectations for the time that it requires, you know, and what I am capable of doing and what is best left for the professionals. Uh, so uh, we just heard some examples from Darren. It's funny how clients often don't understand the scope of what we can do in VFX and how quickly or how difficult it is. Uh, someone once asked me to like stabilize a pretty straightforward shot. You know, this was just like unstable on a 2D level. This wasn't even like a moving camera shot. And they were like, can you do it in five days? You know, and I was like, mm, I could do this in like five seconds. Uh, but on the other hand, I've had clients say stuff like, hey, like the angle of the shot is a bit weird. Can you like rotate it like 180 degrees so the audience can see what's on the table better? And I'm like, no, <laughs> that's like, that's physically impossible. Like you'd have to reconstruct the whole scene in 3D. You know, and they were asking me to do it in like the space of 30 minutes. So sometimes clients really, like I'm not laughing at clients, by the way, it's not their job to know this stuff, um, but it is a bit like, you know, there's a bit of humor to it, how maybe the people understand like what we can accomplish. So I'm going to say I'm in camp. Yes, love VFX, and we'll do it every chance that I get. Wow. Yeah. So again, what are you doing next Thursday? 
Yeah, that's really cool to kind of hear the the, the broad differences here. Um, so let, let's talk about clients then. So, um, you know, like I said, I, I know a lot of you work with the client in the room or at least work closely with the client and lots of revisions and things like that. Um, how do you handle a client and make your uh, color grading session fun and, you know, chill and all, all that kind of stuff? I think for me that is the easiest part because in my experience when you're enjoying yourself, when you're having fun, other people have fun too and I just think color grading is really, really fun. Um, and you get to a point, I've I chatted with a couple of you guys over the, the weekend about like, you know, when do you get to hang out your banner and say, I am a professional colorist. That's a subjective choice that we, we generally have to make that proclamation ourselves before anyone else starts subscribing to it. But once you do, well, like a good metric that I've uh, discovered for that over the years is when you are more excited than you are nervous to sit on the grade. It doesn't mean that you're not nervous ever. It just means like, I have enough grasp of what I'm doing and I have enough flow of ideas for what we're going to do here that that kind of outweighs any nerves that I might have about sitting with this person. Um, and so for me, at some point, I crossed over that threshold and that's kind of what drives the energy of my sessions is I'm just really, really excited to like make pretty pictures with people in the room together. Yeah, absolutely. It's a, yeah, the banter and the crack we have in my suite is, is second to none. It's a really enjoyable experience. It's, you know, coming to a grade is like, you don't go to a travel agent unhappy, you know, you're going on holiday. It's like the, it's the end of, you know, this uh, months of work in some cases. It's like, let's, and now it's going to look great. Um, so it's a really, you know, it's an enjoyable experience. Obviously there's issues and problems, but I make, I keep the client involved. So to make it a, you know, a pleasant experience, bar the things like, you know, I've got scented candles, make the room smell nice. You know, there's decent coffee. These are staple things that don't open the facility with bad coffee. You, <laughs> it's not going to work. Um, uh, Do you have snacks? We have snacks. We have, uh, yeah, I've got a famous one that, that, that always a you know, nice fresh bowl of fruit. That never gets eaten straight <laughs> for the Haribos. You know, it's, <laughs> yeah. the biscuits and the Haribos, that's what goes. Yeah. Um, so bowl and just little things like uh, keep talking to so once you, once you start assessing the look and you're off down that you know you've got your three days to go now i keep them involved keep yeah they'll, they'll be away on their laptop it, invariably within a couple of hours you know they're on instagram taking pictures of the grading suite going Ooh, starship <laughs> enterprise um and all that stuff but i keep them involved so it's like hey by the way you know are we going okay how's this how's this shot look so just they feel loved then you know, ask them about the production. But you know, they're going to want to talk about all the problems they had on set. This is it's great. So just I keep the conversation going. Obviously, let them work if they need to work. But it's just managing that client. So when they when they leave, it's like that was that was fun. You know, we have. I mean, some of my clients, the you know, the guys at Amazon, we, we do all their music videos. I mean, we know each other really well now. We have an absolute scream in there. And now I'm letting them. There's a point where I know what music they like, so we'll put music on. Uh, if I'm going to put music on in the grade. I check with my client first. Do they want silence? Do they want to work? Uh, do they want to listen? Obviously, we don't want to listen to the program being played back. Enthralling. Yeah, and we'll, we'll listen to it invariably at the end. But it's just it's keeping the keeping the client involved, keeping them informed of what you're doing. Don't you know just just grading blind. They have no idea what you're doing. They know what it's looking like, but I'm like I'm just yeah you know, I'm just enhancing the sky at the minute. Okay, I'm, I'm focusing on the sky then. They can they can see what you're working on. I'm trying yeah. I try and sort of narrate a little bit without annoying them if they want to work. That's smart. Narrative. Yeah, it's just keep, just keeping them involved. And if they're looking distant and like, just hey, what do you think? We're we going too warm here. We're we going just. They feel loved then, you know. So always make sure they're happy. Let them know if you're taking a break. I'm, I'm not necessarily charging for every single 15 minutes. Like, don't panic if I go to the toilet. You know, it's like, <laughs> that's 12 yeah. pounds. You just. Cost me. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, we, we can we can. I make it a light experience. It's just generally. Good fun, yeah, nice. And I enjoy what I do. You know, it's like it's it's not dull. <laughs> yeah, it's a fun job. Yeah, Daria. I feel like I'm uh, I'm constantly on two ends of an extreme when it comes to clients because I either work from my home suite, which is where I am right now, which means that like this is usually with remote clients, so they're sending me stuff from overseas and then I'm sending it back. So then they're not really watching over my shoulder as I grade. Uh, and it's more of just like a written review process or maybe like a Skype call. Uh, so I have to learn, uh, 
how to communicate with clients when they don't necessarily know like the lingo or the technical terms for things. Uh, so sometimes as they're describing something, they might use technical terms, but I realize that they actually mean something else. So like not everyone uses the word contrast to actually mean contrast. Some, sometimes they're talking about shadows specifically. So that's one example. Or like sometimes people will talk about um, scaling and they'll say that they want to uh, like zoom out when they in fact they mean scale in, which was once like this was an ordeal that I had for several days because a, 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 a client kept asking me to zoom out <laughs> uh, of this like text the graphic that I was creating for them. And this was so reiterative, like I would send them a version and like they would repeat, like send back like a thing like, yeah, the timing is perfect, but you know, can you just like zoom out? And eventually I had to make it so, so tiny on the screen, it was becoming illegible. And I'm like, what are they talking? What do they need? You know, this is impossible. And eventually I realized they actually wanted me to scale up. I don't know why they were using zoom out as a term. So I made the text much larger and then they were like, yes, this is it. This is what we meant. So that's kind of a thing, like you always have to understand what the client actually means. It's good to ask for like references and images that they could provide for what, what like the project in their mind is. And also like the other half of my work is usually when I get sent uh, to work like in a post-production suite or like work on set. Uh, and then, yeah, you are talking much more directly and the exchange of ideas is much faster, but you still have to keep in mind like the difference in lingo and you have to be understanding and patient. Um, I, I don't know about you guys, how do you feel about doing the first pass in front of clients? I find it incredibly difficult, um, especially for maybe younger directors or younger filmmakers who have maybe not experienced color grading as much. Uh, I feel like I, I've, I describe the experience as cooking for someone who has never seen cooking before, you know? So like, as you start the process, they're gonna go like, oh, raw chicken, gross, I'm not eating that. Mm -hmm. You know, and I'm just like, hang on, you know, like I'm not, like, <laughs> I, know it, I know it looks really magenta right now, but it's, I'm not gonna keep it that way, you know? So it's like, it's really stressful. I, I definitely know what you mean. And I think that that's actually goes back to like Darren's idea about narrating extensively. In that first pass, if we're in the room together, there's a lot of narrating where uh, like, one of my most common like lines that I'll just state out loud is like, just bear with me, I'm just trying some stuff out. And that's literally what I'm doing is just grabbing knobs and throwing the ball this direction or that direction. I just want to see what's in there, you know, but like, I promise I'm not going to make you eat the raw chicken, as, as Daria says. That's a great, great point. I, mean, I, I tell them when they can start speaking. So it's like... <laughs> <laughs> you may speak Don't now. <laughs> I know the sky Silence. is overexposed. I'm mean, not that stupid, you know. So, um, uh, and then in contrast to when I move on to the next shot, if they haven't said anything, so you can speak now. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, so, okay, so just talking with somebody who's not a colorist, you know, um, who might be sitting behind you looking over your shoulder, um, how do you get how do you get that common language like especially if they want something like a certain look you know if they say oh I want it to look like this movie um, how do you communicate and, and and find this kind of common ground so that you can actually make an image you both like or at least the, I mean that the client likes you know you're talking inexperienced like the people who haven't done a color yeah like, I mean yeah. somebody who might not know exactly how to tell you but they're like man I, I really like the matrix I, I really want it to look like that, you know? Yeah. Do you want to go? Yeah, you know, the, when it comes to like specifically referencing other visual media, um, for me, the devil is in the details there. So it's like, let's take The Matrix. That's actually a great example because we've probably all had at least one of those sessions before. Yeah. I was like, okay, cool. Let's look at The Matrix. That's the first thing for me is like, you're not, I mean, we're not going to do like, okay, you're looking at the still on your phone and then we're going to look at your images on my monitor. I'll pull those things in ahead of time if we've talked about it ahead of time. And then we'll pull it up and look at it and I'll try to have a meaningful conversation about like, okay, where do, where does, where do these images and your images overlap in terms of subject matter, production design, art direction, et cetera? And where are they completely far flung and it would be preposterous to even think that like, you know, like where Keanu Reeves was not available for your project. So he's not, that's not gonna be an overlapping frame content. And it sounds silly, but it really is helpful to enumerate where is there a meaningful overlap and where is there just a hopeless divergence in terms of what makes these frames these frames and what makes your frames your frames. And the end of the conversation for me that we're aiming at is like, let's pick out two or three characteristics that you find really compelling about these images 
and we're going to borrow them and use them to elevate your images into their ideal form. But this uh, notion that, like, I used to feel a ton of pressure early in my career when someone would show me, like, you know, whatever it is, like, we're going to look at, like, No Country for Old Men or Apocalypse Now, and I get really frustrated that I could never make their images look like that movie. It's like the, the images have completely different DNA. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's not, there, there's, it's borderline meaningless to say make this look like that without some like tangible anchors of like, I like the way the shadows feel rich but soft, and I like the way the colors feel saturated but tasteful, you know, like some very specific uh, characteristics. If you don't have those things, it's really not a meaningful exercise at all, in my opinion, to say, oh, we're going to make it look like that. No, you're not. Those frames look like that. Your frames are going to look like your I just, frames. I just want it really green. Yeah. <laughs> I don't see what's so hard. You're a professional yeah. colorist, man. Just make it You have, super like, green. so many color wheels. Just push it green. Yeah, just make the green one. <laughs> that I got you covered on. Sick. That's all I needed. I mean, it's basically called realizing expectations, isn't it? You know, it's, um, so, uh, you know, we can take from the matrix, we can take essence of that, that are the blues cool? Uh, yes, it's got a green hue, you know, we, we, we can, I can put that into your program. Is it going to look any good after that? Let's try, you know, let's have, let's have an experiment. I want my Hallmark channel, good, good, good feeling, okay. family yeah, I, film to look gritty and green. <laughs> I mean, well, I'm always going to give you what you want first, and then we can go my way. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I mean, it actually is really interesting when you ask that question, if you look at the images and just kick it right back to them, okay, let me ask you, like, what do you love about these? What do you think is working really, really well in terms of the way the images were mastered? And the answer is very rarely what, what we see when we're looking at it. it. Everyone has their own little, I tell you what I love about it. It's like the, the way that the shadows die above zero or whatever it might be. Like, when you can ask those questions, like, what do you love about that? You can figure out, all right, well, we can borrow that idea or, or translate it into a, a palatable form for your images. Yeah. Or oh, how about this? Daria? <laughs> yeah, uh, two comments on that is, number one, I love, love clients who provide visual references from prior, like, projects, so, like, TV shows and films. That's incredibly helpful for me. And, uh, like, Cullen and Darren said, it's about capturing the essence of what they're seeing rather than directly trying to translate the image. Uh, and I think this is maybe sometimes misunderstood by young filmmakers or film students. Uh, they feel that like being original is the most important thing. So therefore you cannot possibly refer to previous projects because you're clearly not being original. Uh, it shouldn't be taught that way. It should be taught that uh, every professional production, you know, that I've ever been involved with, they will have those references, you know, in that initial pack uh, when they're first trying to get the film off the ground, trying to get it produced. It will include tons of images from prior films and TV shows explaining the look that they're going for in terms of production design and for color grade. So it's completely normal, it's natural, and it doesn't mean that you're unoriginal. We need those images. We need to see what you're seeing in your head. But then secondly, and this is something also that was uh, alluded to, is that there is like a scope to uh, what we can achieve with those reference images. So uh, very often, you know, you might get something from, uh, I feel like a Godfather is a very common one that I get. Uh, you know, they'll share it with me and then I'll see their film and it's like a couple of people talking in a living room in Britain with a white wall behind them. And I'm like, I really, can't do what like this really lush image that you shared you know that's like set in the italian countryside with like this really warm you know directional lights coming in like i cannot recreate this because your lighting conditions are different uh so that's kind of like if you wanted it to look like the godfather you had to light it like the godfather so that's kind of like my piece of advice for cinematographers who have a very distinct look in mind is that it begins on set if no it begins in pre-production uh, but then there's yeah we can do the final touches yeah. There's also an element where they don't come with references. So I think part of your question was, how do we talk color mm -hmm. you know, to people? So if, if they're coming in, they, they haven't got a reference, they've got the film, they're just expecting you to make it look fantastic. Um, I'll often give them a little colorist chat, like, is it your first color grading experience? I've given terms that they can use. So obviously, you know, warmer, colder, more contrast, less contrast. But things like, uh, I say to them, we can split the difference. You know, you say to me, split the difference. So just feed them a few terms that you know, some people don't know how to explain contrast. I, I even, I always say to all my clients, well, if you don't like it, 
just say you don't like it, you don't have a reason. Let's just. Oh, that's I, a great I'm, idea. I'm, I'm 54. You know, I'm 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 five foot five, but I'm I'm hard as nails. I can take any abuse. <laughs> <laughs> um, just say you don't like it. It's like it's fine. I'm not going to be offended. Let's. I don't want you leaving the room going, oh, we should, you know, or we're two hours in and now you tell me you don't like it. Uh, just so you don't like it, you don't have to have a reason. It's, like, it's great, let's start again. It's, That's a great, it's, a great it, it idea. I've even done it myself. Oh, sorry. I've just blown the stream. Um, is that all right? I've, I've, yeah, um, good. But I've done it myself where I've, I've been grading, grading, grading. I'm like, this is just not quite right. Reset. I get it in five seconds. I mean, and that's a great one too. Like, I, it takes a certain amount of like confidence to do, especially in the room with clients. But it's a yeah. great move to be able to yourself say, you know what, I'm not loving this. What do you? How do you feel? Yeah. And just try it fresh. No clients ever said they don't like it, by the way. Just, uh, of course, it's just there for them. <laughs> yeah. Um, awesome. Thank you, guys. Uh, so, couple couple more uh, questions here. Um, so, if when somebody is kind of getting into color. Uh, I, I think there's a couple of questions that come up. Um, one is, how do you like? What's the difference between, uh, in your opinion, like a a non-pro color grade, somebody who obviously doesn't really know what they're doing, versus somebody who's you know done this a million times? Like, are there any kind of telltale factors uh, that you know that you could share with us? That you're like, man, that's a that's a dead giveaway. This person hasn't done a whole lot of color. Tell me about it. Uh, let's start with uh, Daria this time. Yeah, how about it? Uh, so I, I feel there's a few phases that every colorist goes through. Like I, I kind of mentally almost like keep a list of it because these are phases that I went through and I see other people doing them too. So like number one, the phase number one is always like realizing that you can put color into all the different tonal ranges. So then you do. So like if you watch student projects, they will always have like these really vibrant like red shadows or blue shadows, you know, and like green highlights and magenta highlights and it's like uh and it's because they've discovered they can do it they sort of apply it and they think that every film every scene has to have like this really distinct look so that's probably phase number one uh phase number two is probably the exact opposite it's like dialing it way way back and back when like we were shooting primarily log a lot of people were just sticking with log footage especially if the director had like gotten accust accustomed to the look um, so then you would keep like these really almost like pastel tones throughout the film. Um, but that's not as big a problem these days. I suppose like, even though we don't shoot log as much, like raw media is still interpreted as log. So it's kind of like still sometimes like it sl slips through. Um, and I think like keeping things relatively neutral is is where you start to enter your professional phase, I guess, is like working with the colors that the DP intended and enhancing what they did rather than trying to overpower it. Uh, but then still, of course, working with, with them to create a look afterwards. Yeah, the, the, those are, are, are great mm -hmm. things. I, I feel like the, this is a broad one, but for me, the giveaway is like, you know, when you think about image mastering, color grading, it's like we, we have this little container. We only have like, most of us are still grading SDR at this point. We, you know, we have our little hundred nits. We have our, whatever that is, six and a half ish stops of latitude to work with. And we have a color, total amount of color we can achieve that is significantly less than all the color that our eyes can see. And those things are hopefully gonna continue to improve and our palette will widen in terms of the, what we have to work with. But if you look at that, you know, like, it's just how well do you use the, the, the notes on the keyboard that you have, the notes on the piano that you have. So the mistake that I see with young colorists is it's really one of two variations. They are either like blowing out past the edges of what they can do and reminding me as a viewer that I'm looking at a screen and not looking into an image, or they're not taking advantage of the container and they're, and they're like going like with completely flat contrast or with a completely like monochrome image that can be great for like dramatic effect if you are contrasting that with uh, another treatment of an image at another point. But those are the two big things for me is like, okay, you're either spilling out over the sides or you're not leveraging the container that you've been given because it's that's all we have as colorists is, you know, whatever display we're working on is like, you know, we've got those six and a half stops. We've got that color volume that's way the heck lower than our eyes can see. You better be taking good advantage of it and you better not be reminding me of the limitation inherent in that. If you're getting those things wrong, even occasionally, um, that's kind of the mark of, of someone who's not maybe hit that, that pro threshold yet for me. Yeah, I, I, 
I mean, it's uh, something that you were talking about earlier, Cullen, was, so I might be working in these you know, 17, 25 no trees. They're not full. I'm not, I'm not using all of them. I think, uh, yeah, I'm going to get my look looking really good in two notes. Um, yeah, my, my clients have been saying they're going to be impressed with two notes. Uh, I'm then going to do the layers on top, so I'm going to put the halation in or whatever I'm going to do. But I find with um, uh, less experienced colorists, and I, I, I do a fair bit of training, so I've seen a fair few. Uh, it's uh, it's going here, and then it goes here, and then let's stick a warper on it to repair that that I did, mm -hmm. and it's a sticking plaster on there, and I'll use that tool to pull that back. And it's like, wait, you, what's going on here? You, yeah, and it looks. Let's switch it on and off, and then. I've, I've done this with a couple of there's a, there's a there's a couple of people that I sort of mentor and we criticise their or I sort of critique their node structure and they've not noticed that a, the guy's jumper's completely oversaturated because they've been focusing on somewhere else. Rip it all to bits. Two nodes looks fantastic, you know. So I think it's you know it's getting that wow factor very quickly. Um, you, you know, your clients expect it to look great very quickly. Um, I think that's that's when you're sort of pro versus you're still you're still gaining your skills. I'm not doing any damage in my first two nodes. This my, my my image is still as pristine as as it was given to me. It's just looking a bit better. Yeah, yeah. Makes great sense. great advice. I think Keep, keeping it simple and you know yeah. doing doing again those big strokes uh, and doing them well. Yeah. Again, based on experience. That's, yeah. They want to use all the tools because they're there. Like I've, you know. Yeah. Exactly. They because they're flashy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, last question. So, uh, and then, then we're going to go have lunch. Oh, baby. Uh, <laughs> so if somebody is getting into color, they're super excited and they're like, I, I think, uh, I think I might be looking into a color surface. When do you think is a great time for somebody to actually invest in a color surface or a, uh, you know, big expensive monitor or, you know, painting their whole suite gray and making sure they have a thousand dollar lights behind, you know, all of that stuff. When does that come up? What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> Look, I, 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 I'm a big believer in, you know, like, I'll, 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 I'll give you guys a little anecdote uh, very quickly from the way things have gone for me. I've been a contractor, I've been a, a staff artist, I've been a business owner, and, and most of those things more than once at different points in my career. My most recent uh, season, where I'm now running my, my color grading business, that started with like a laptop. And I got the screen calibrated on it so that I could do decent work for my clients. And the big difference that time around versus the prior attempts that I've made at running a business were that the investment went into me. I just invested like crazy in getting really, really good and really, really knowledgeable at what I know how to do. Um, and I basically, the, I, I don't buy gear. My clients buy gear when they need that gear in order for me to fulfill the work. So I let them drive that thing and say, hey, we gotta do HDR, get an HDR monitor. You know, like you, you invest in those things as your billings, uh, you know, a lot for, and you know, you invest primarily in yourself, not in your equipment or in your trappings or whatever it may be. Man, great advice. Other thoughts, things to add? Who's next, me? Sure. I'm really the wrong person to ask because I love buying kit. I just... <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you pass on, on the way in here. I go for my, yeah, I go and see my accountant once a year. They're like, oh God, what are you doing? <laughs> um, oh God, I mean, how do I, I just love kit. I, I, I've done a studio tour recently. You can see what I've got. I mean, I, I've got the advanced panel. I've got, <laughs> I just, but it's, it's an investment. Yeah, I'm, uh, you know, the money comes back on those things. It's, it's my tools. I've got to use these things every single day. I want the best kit that I can possibly have. I'm, you know, I, I've been running a business successfully for 25 years. That's allowed me to have, you know, enough money to just not think too hard about it. I'm not saying I'm super rich or anything, but it's, it, there's enough. There's enough. I'm making enough money from it that I'm not overly worried about buying a Mac Pro 2019 in the middle of COVID, when I actually had no work at all. <laughs> um, but yeah, I'm. I, I, I don't regret buying any of my kit. If my, if my kit's going to help me in help me increase five percent of my business, I need it. I also I also invest very much so I'm ready. So for HDR, we're kitted out already. Um, I haven't had any HDR work yet. So if anyone needs any HDR work, I've got really nice monitors already. <laughs> really <laughs> nice um, so yeah, I'm, I don't I don't even think I started slowly. I kind of just went. 
I went in for it. Yeah. But it's, the, yeah, I get, I get return on it, you know. Daria, other thoughts on, on gear, when to purchase gear? Yeah, I think I'm, I'm more like Cullen. I went at a snail's pace. Uh, I, I think I did like two features on a, like a, a workstation at film school. <laughs> So it was not even a grading monitor for one of those. I was using like FCP7, uh, so the color tools in that. Uh, and yeah, for a very long time, I didn't have like either monitor or a panel. Uh, and I think I did all right, you know, like I, like I said, like my kind of the, the whole color aspect sort of followed my compositing uh, work. So then eventually when it took over and became the majority of my work, that's when I was like, okay, I really should have like a proper uh, you know, cali properly calibrated monitor. I saw in the chat uh, earlier, somebody was asking uh, which one I use. I use the Flanders Scientific. Uh, this model, I think, is obsolete. So DM240, they don't sell it anymore, but there's a newer ver uh, um, model that just came out that you can see on their website. Um, and it's like pre-calibrated for you when you receive it. So uh, yeah, like it always made sense to me to buy this type of equipment when you're already making money off this type of work. You know, I always say that, you know, once you've made your first, like say 3000 or $2,000, that's when it makes sense to buy the mini panel for color grading. You know, once mm -hmm. you make a few thousand more, that's when it makes sense to buy a color grading monitor. Especially if like early on in your career, you're most likely doing a lot of your output uh, for like for online videos, you know, so for like YouTube and Vimeo. And in that case, using your computer monitor, like it's not out of the question. It's not the worst thing you could be doing. It could still look pretty nice. Uh, it just won't be like super accurate, obviously, as it would be with a grading monitor. And if you're delivering for like broadcast or obviously for cinema, then absolutely you do need that grading monitor and that precision. Uh, but yeah, I think if you're just starting out, there's still a lot you can do without any of like the bells and whistles now than when I was building my suite. I mean, yeah. yeah, people look at my suite and go, well, you've got loads of stuff. Like I've accumulated this since 1999, you know? Um, it's, I've not just gone out and bought all this stuff. And so when I got, like I did buy the advanced panel, there wasn't a mini or a micro panel then. That decision now would be very different. I'd buy a, a mini panel and have three stream decks on it or something like that, you know? So yeah. I didn't necessarily have the choice as much. You know, I wanted a panel, that was, that was the panel. That was, that was what you got. I don't, sure. I don't regret it, but I've had it 10 years. Yeah. It's certainly yeah. paid for itself. <laughs> you know. Well, this has been wonderful, guys. Thank you so much for, uh, for your wisdom and for uh, all this awesome color grading knowledge. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Daria, for zooming in. Again, so, so sad that you couldn't be here, but wonderful. Yeah, we miss you, buddy. Miss you, yeah. Daria. <laughs> wonderful yeah. to have you here digitally. So thank you. All right. Thank you. Next year. Thank you.